it was my great joy the other day to be back talking to Warwick Schiller on his Journey On podcast. And this time it was actually the journey resumed because it was our second get together on his podcast. And this time we were talking about what's happened within my work in the last year since um, the first time I was on the podcast back in July 2021. And it's been a lot. So, yeah, we talked about that. But we also, as usual, went down a few rabbit holes. And um, (laughs) I'll let you listen and make your own mind up. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, If you're interested in my work, please do go to my website, www.kathyprice.co.uk. There you'll find all the information about my work, um, links to all my videos, my YouTube channel. And if you choose to click subscribe while you're there, uh, you will be up to date with all the news when I send my newsletters out. But also you will be entered into a subscriber only draw for a free session of uh, Point of Balance. And that takes place every month. So I hope you enjoy this podcast as much as I enjoyed talking to Warwick. Journey on, the magic lies within the trails we ride. You're listening to the Journey On podcast with Warwick Schiller. Warwick is a horseman, trainer, international clinician, and author who helps empower horse people from all over the world with the skills, knowledge, and mindsets needed to create trusting partnerships with their horses. Warwick offers a free seven-day trial to his comprehensive online video library that includes hundreds of full-length training videos and several home study courses at videos.warwickshiller.com. Just because you see what he shows. G'day everyone, welcome back to the Journey On Podcast. I'm your host Warwick Schiller and what we've been doing a little bit lately is going back and doing something we call the Journey Resumes instead of the Journey On podcast. It's the Journey Resumes and I have been going back and chatting with some previous podcast guests to see what they've been up to since the uh, the last time we've chatted and it's my pleasure today to to have on the podcast my good friend Kathy Price and Kathy is going to be one of the presenters at the Journey on Podcast Summit in San Antonio in October, which I'm looking forward to seeing her there. But it was really good to catch up with her again on the podcast and um, see exactly what she's been up to since the last time we chatted. So I hope you enjoy this chat with Kathy as much as I did. Kathy Price, welcome back to the Journey on Podcast Resumes. Warwick Schiller. As always, delighted to be here. Thank you for the invite. Oh, no worries. This is going to be fun. We're going to find <laughs> out what you've been uh, up to. So when, when, were you on the po- when were you on the podcast the first time around? Do you remember? Yeah, I think it was July last year. So just okay, over so a it's, year. It's been a bit over a year. Mm-hmm. Um, how's that year been for you? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. It has been amazing. Um you know, we put that podcast out there and I put the weirdness out. I thought, right, time, you knew it, nobody else really did. So I thought it was time to put it out there. And I honestly did not know what the reaction would be. I was quite happy to do it. I just did not know. I never, ever, ever expected that reaction. And it was, yes, people were amazing. They were really interested in my work. You know, loads and loads of people. But there was also people just getting in contact with me saying, thank you for being authentic because now I can step into me. I can step into my truth. And that was so, so amazing. Um, You know, I was so grateful to have that chance to do that. And then that's helped somebody else in that respect. And if I hadn't have done that, you know, they wouldn't have heard that authenticity. But it was... Oh, I can't tell you. I mean, people still all through this time in the past year. I mean, there was massive reaction afterwards, but there's always people. I've just listened to the podcast or and it's this podcast, that podcast that we did that has really caught people's you know attention in some way. 
And then, <laughs> which makes me giggle <laughs> a lot, <laughs> I have people going, I've been stalking you, Kathy Price, <laughs> on the internet. And it's like, okay, that's good, wonderful. But no, it's a nice stalking because they've just found the different podcasts I've done, like with Jane and um, Ronnie, and listened to those. Um, and then they've sort of been intrigued or whatever and got in touch. So it's been awe inspiring. That's the only word I can say. And total gratitude for you to for having me on that podcast because it really has changed everything oh cool it was it was fun you know and in that podcast i had you tell a story about not the first time we met but first time we already sat down had a had a chat and was at a, a clinic in england and we sat down and you were <laughs> telling me about out-of-body experiences and all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff and i looked at you and like who do you tell this shit to? <laughs> and you were like, well, you got to pick your audience. Well, then I made you come on the podcast and tell the same stories to a large audience. And it sounds like that there's quote unquote weird things that you talked about are not actually that weird. You just needed to be able to connect with other people who either have had those experience or resonated with those experiences. I think that's exactly right. And that's where... You could say the vulnerability is that, you know, it was vulnerable doing that. But when, as you said, from the reaction that I had back, there's a lot of people. Um, exactly what you said resonated with it. And some really, um, oh, I think there was a couple of experiences I didn't talk about where people got in touch with me describing what had happened to them. And I was going, oh, my God, that's happened to me as well. So it as you said it's the I don't know people resonating the energy resonating between people you recognize something and you say right I'm safe to relate to that person in that respect so yeah but I, as you said that I can't call myself weird anymore because there's lots of people who <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so you know a lot of people resonated with with some of the things you had to say but the 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 couple of really strange experiences you talked about have you had <laughs> have you had other people contact you and go hey uh, that that happened to me too yes let me think back to the the different not not you know walking through a wall maybe not but I think people were mentioned maybe mentioned going out of body and stuff like that but the one the one that I sort of alluded to just now was when I had quite a dramatic fall off a horse and landed flat on my back and I was okay. I had actually ripped my um, um, what's the what's the muscle behind you, the back of your leg, hamstring. I didn't realise it at the time. I could still walk, but but as I walked back, it felt like I was in a different dimension. That everything was the same, but it wasn't. And I wasn't at all um, knocked out or you know had concussion. And somebody got in touch with me, and she described exactly the same exactly the same thing so that was really cool because that was something i was thinking oh i don't know i don't know did, did i imagine it you know what you do when it's something like that right but she actually got in touch and described it and i thought oh my lord and i hadn't actually said anything about that so that was really cool so you kind of felt like you're in a bit of a different dimension did did you stay there or do you feel like that kind of went away? It went away, definitely. It was a process. So it seemed like the distance, as I walked back, which probably took about half an hour, and I was totally okay, I could walk, you know, obviously not use this leg properly, but it wasn't hurting if I walked in a certain way. Um, and it was when I got back that I looked back, you know, sort of thought back to the journey I'd just done. And it was oh, it's so hard to describe. But it was as if I was doing the same thing, but in a different place. And there were different, there was a different sort of energy to it. And I remember t saying to the people I was with, you know, this, and they were just like, you're concussed, it's your concussed. And I said, ask me any question you like. I am not concussed. And I know I wrote it all down very clearly at the time. And so, no, it only lasted for, you know, however long that was, half an hour, or if it was that long, I don't know. It might have been shorter, you know, and, time collapsed or um, telescoped but it was almost because I had maybe my thought about it was I had such a shock when I hit the floor you know it was a full body flat down did that do something I don't know 
And again, I'm open to whatever it is, but that was my experience. And what... What was different about it? Like, what, 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 what makes you think, like, I'm not in the same place anymore? It was as though I could, I could see myself, the physical, almost, you know, walking in the place I was, but I was also in a different place. So there, it was mm. a, I'm sure there were other people there as well. I'm trying to think back now because we're talking, oh, 14 years. Um, but I'm sure I wrote down that there was there were other people there, but it was as though I was going along the same route. But I was aware that I was also on the original route, you know, the real life in commas. Didn't didn't you tell me one of those weird experiences you had? Didn't you tell me you had the experience of looking at yourself? That was when. Um, only, only when I went out of body. Yes, that's what I mean. Yeah, like yeah. You, you... Uh, yeah, you, I was lying on the bed and I was going right now and going through the wall, you know, as you do. I, no, I thought there was, but I thought there was, I thought there was, maybe it wasn't you. No, Someone I'm else maybe back told that me. I can't think of a, where I. I remember somebody telling me that they, they went out of body, mm. but they were beside themselves. Like you were, you know, you were lying on the bed in this case, but no, this was like, you were sitting there like you are right now yeah. and you came out of your body and you turned and you looked at yourself sitting there. It no, wasn't like no, you'd been laying was, down. Yeah. Like, and I think whoever was telling me this, they said they looked at themselves. So they, they, they examined okay, so themselves. They, yeah. Yeah. No, that was, they me. examined themselves, but themselves looked at themselves. <laughs> so, you know, the, yeah. the out of body experience, like, so they're looking at the physical body yeah. and the physical body turned and looked at oh, them God. and smiled at them. <laughs> no, that like, definitely wasn't me. At, <laughs> you looked at you and went, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> that would be freaking weird, wouldn't it? Oh my Lord. That is even weirder than me. No, no, not been there. Not done that one. Yeah. Okay. I forget. Who? Yeah, I wonder who that was because I don't remember that being described oh, on the on no, the old podcast. Okay, yeah, <laughs> no, it, I I can't remember where I've heard that, but yeah, that would be that would be pretty awesome. That would be pretty awesome. Well, you know, so we we chat quite a bit, and whenever I have some sort of a weird experience, I can't explain or whatever, I'll call you and we'll talk through it. But you told me something interesting recently on one of our phone chats is that the area that you live in, mm -hmm. in Wilds, that valley is a bit of a place of mm. weird wooish. Well, it's got a lot of history, which um, I didn't realise to begin with. And um, basically, we, it's a valley not many people go through. It doesn't go anywhere. So it's quite a quiet valley. And it's a glacier. Right, so you're up so, You're up against the ocean, basically, aren't you? Well, it's seven miles to the okay. sea from us. Yeah. So, you know, we're in the valley and the river runs down, the little streamy river runs down. But what is really cool is in 2008, we had a drought. And um, there's an archaeologist, Dr. Toby Driver, who he does flyovers. He takes a small plane up and he looks for new crop marks because the crop marks, you know, in the drought... You can see where the old walls were, where old buildings were, and he's found loads of Roman stuff. And this 2008, I think it was, I was in the house and I got a knock on the door and he said, oh, he introduced himself. And he said, we, I think you own that field down there. And he said, we found a crop mark. Could I go in there and see it? And I was like, only if I can come with you, because it's like, yes. So went down. No one had ever noticed this before because it's there quite visible once you know but from above, you see it. And it was a 40 meter what, uh, diameter double circle. So there were like two green circles in the parched field. And then there were two, there's um, a sunken barrow um, just outside the circle. And then equidistant from the center, which is in the next field, there's another barrow, which they think has never been disturbed. So this- What is a barrow? A uh, barrow is like a burial place. Um, okay, yeah. One of these, the one in our field, they're not sure if it was a sunken barrow, which is where they might have been chucking all their rubbish and doing stuff like that. But mm -hmm. so he explained to me that this was end of Stone Age. 
beginning of Bronze Age, so about four and a half thousand years old, probably older than Stonehenge. You won't find metallic stuff there because it was probably too early. So that was that which was, and it became marked as a, a monument. And it just made me think, what is it about this valley? that Because it would have had a huge um, earth pile in the middle um, with rocks, you know, big stones would have been put up and the burial would have been in there. Then they cover it with earth. And then there's the two ditches on the outside. And so there's a lot of work gone into that four and a half thousand years ago. So that was that. And then in 2018, um, there was an even harsher drought. And he came back and he found medieval burials in there as well, as though they knew that this was a place of great significance. And so that was really clear that year. And I was walking between the two circles. And I had a couple of friends with me that were staying in the bungalow. And so we walked around this. And then I went back up to the bungalow, which is only about five minutes walk away. And suddenly I could see this visual aberration is the only way I can describe it in my eye. I think it was in one eye or was it both? I can't remember. Anyway, but it was like um, two zigzags um, shimmering, crossing over each other and shimmering. And it was an arc. So it was like three quarters of a circle. And I kept looking at things and rubbing my eyes and closing my eyes. And it was constant. It was there all the time. It wasn't as though I'd got something in my eye that was causing, you know, causing irritation. It was um, a real phenomena and uh, phenomenon, phenomena, phenomenon. Um, it just clicked to me that we'd walked around three quarters of that circle and this energy was three quarters, this whatever it was in my eye was three quarters of the circle. So I don't know, but it felt to me like I'd picked up or there was some energy that had come from that as I walked around because it was just straight after we walked out of that circle. And so, yeah. And what did it, what did it look like? <laughs> Are you trying to get me to describe it again? It's two. Uh, no, I want to make a point here. <laughs> <laughs> two. Oh, I know where you're going. So tell me again what did it look like? Okay, it looked like two zigzags intersecting, um, crossing each other, and it was shimmering with energy. <laughs> so I'll let you say the next bit. <laughs> so I've just read a book called The Cosmic Serpent mm -hmm. by a fellow named someone Narby. Come here, this guy's name, Jeremy Narby. <clears throat> and the cosmic serpent. Um, maybe I should see if I can find a uh, little review of it or something so I can say what the book's about because it would be very hard for me to describe what the book's about. I'm going to look this up right here live on. So Google Books says, well, it says a gripping investigation that opens fresh perspectives on biology and anthropology at the cutting edge of contemporary thought. So this book, The Cosmic Serpent, here we go, Amazon will tell us about it. <laughs> this adventure in science and imagination, which the medical tribune says might herald a Copernican revolution for the life sciences, yeah. leads the reader through unexplored jungles and uncharted aspects of mind to the heart of knowledge in a first-person narrative of scientific discovery that opens new perspectives on biology, anthropology, and the limits of rationalism, <laughs> the cosmic serpent reveals how startlingly different the world around us appears when we open our minds to it. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, that's So good it's book. written by this guy named Jeremy Narby, and he was a, an anthropologist who went to um, Peru to study uh, Peruvian tribes. And while he was there, this is in the, maybe in the 80s? Um, when that was, yeah, I Remember? don't, I haven't got I, the books next door. Uh, I can look, but yeah, it was because it related a lot back to the um, early anthropologists who sort of anthrop who sort of um, dismissed the shamans and everything as as being nothing, you know, having no savages and stuff like that. And he was the one, I think, who started to change that perception 
Yeah, so he's, he's an anthropologist and he's studying these tribes and there's a lot of uh, what they call ayahuascaros, who are the shamans who do the, the ayahuasca. And they don't just do the ayahuasca, they actually have a, um, there is a long apprenticeship and they, you know, they go into the jungle for long periods of time, like for years, and eat only bananas and like they eat three things or something or other for years and do all these ayahuasca journeys and then they, um, anyway, so he is around these guys a lot and they actually talk him into having an ayahuasca journey and he noticed in his ayahuasca journey that he saw these two um, serpents intertwine, these shimmering, that's what made me think about when you said shimmering, these shimmering um, serpents intertwined. And, and when I went to Florida and did that ayahuasca ceremonies, I saw uh, snakes in there too, and it's very, it's very common to see that. But anyway, he, and he doesn't think that too much about it. And as the years go by, he starts looking and looking into more and more things. And he looks at this book who was, it was, it's a book of paintings by a guy who was an ayahuasquero. So one of the Peruvian shamans who also had a photographic memory. And what this guy would do is after a, a, a you know, an ayahuasca experience, he'd come back and he'd paint what he saw. And so he, he started looking, he had this, this Jeremy Narby guy had this idea to look through this book and he was just looking at the, the little little details in these paintings and something he came across was these intertwined serpents. And then he talked about in all indigenous cultures, whether it's Australian Aborigines that have the rainbow serpent as a, as a um, creation myth or it doesn't matter what native population you look into they all have like these intertwined serpents or these ladders sort of thing yeah. as part of the myth and even in the like the arctic circle like the, the, there's a russian uh indigenous people who snakes don't exist there they've never seen snakes but in their mythology there are intertwined snakes in their mythology you talk about this stuff and here's the drum roll the basically <laughs> the the punchline of the whole thing is his idea is that all of these shamans could see the creation of DNA, what mm. DNA looks like way before. Well, who are the two guys that discovered Watson and Crick? Uh, Dean, Watson and Crick. Um, so these two scientists unraveled the double helix of the, the double helix in when was that? 1953, something like that, was that? Have a little well, search. they discovered DNA in the fifties, but what? But when they mapped DNA, when was that? Oh that was God! Like it, the, what do you mean? Uh, get the human genome? Yes, oh, that, that was, was much recent. Four? No, I think it was later 90. than that. I think to, when mm. they actually mapped the thing. But the the thing as well that has really sunk into my consciousness since reading that book, and this is where Warwick, you do amaze me because I've read that book really recently, and I can't remember any of that in detail. <laughs> I just get the the gist of it. So just what you're saying, so you've got the double serpents, you've got the vines, that's another way they, they show it. You've got the ladders, and as you said, throughout the different shamanic cultures. But when you boil down to it, there are only four proteins, nucleotides, A, T, G, and C. Uh, if I can remember them, adenosine, guanine, tyrosine, and cy cytosine. I might have got the cytosine, it might have got those names wrong. But those four that is DNA and those four in their combination and they always match to each other those four form every form of life on this planet that is There's DNA four proteins. four proteins and if yeah. you think of that and you think of the variety of life from single-celled amoeba you know up to whales and all the different plants and the other thing about that book which I think really needs to be said as well is how the uh that jeremy narby he realized he wouldn't listen to begin with that when mm. the uh shamans were saying you know we've, we've asked this question how do they know which plants to use and the shaman said the plants tell us the plants tell us and that's part of it that the they get the information about which combination of plants not only to use in ceremony but to heal and to use for you know humanity 
the plants are showing themselves to these shamans. And that was the bit that everyone was going, don't be so stupid. But he realised by the end of it that that was the truth, that they were, the shamans were connecting. And the, and the more you go into um, plant life, you know, like the trees where the underground fungi connection, the mycelium, connects them where the mother tree will feed its, its offspring in preference to the other trees. You, the story you've told before about the fourth tree, you know, the giraffes know to go to the fourth tree because the first tree will warn the next three. Things like that. There's so much we don't understand. And this is what I always say. Science only discovers what already exists. So it's not a case of they are creating stuff and producing stuff. They're just finding what's already there. And that's where an open-minded scientist is a wonderful thing. That it's not, oh, that doesn't exist because we can't prove it. Be open and have a look and think, okay, there is that possibility. Let's see what we can do. So, yeah, that, I love that book. So let's get back to the cosmic serpent. So <laughs> he basically is saying that way before we ever discovered what DNA was, all these shamans knew what DNA was mm -hmm. and they came to them in visions, whether it was ayahuasca visions or visions from chanting or whatever, whatever altered states of consciousness, however you put yourself in altered states of consciousness. But this information would come to them, but it's there. The thing that you, the energy you described mm, about I know. The things. I, and I haven't, and I drew it, I drew it in a book. As soon as I, uh, you know, I've got this book that everything goes into, and well, I've got 23 books actually that everything goes into, but this one book, and it was exactly that. It was a uh, Ziggy Zags shimmering, but it was interesting. It was the three quarters of the circle, and that's what I'd walked around. That's what made me think about the, the you know, the ancient circle. Yeah, so if anybody wants a, a rabbit hole to go down, the, read that uh, book. And, yes, the, and that was quite interesting because you got in touch with me and said, oh, Kathy, you've got to read this book. And you said the name and I thought, sure, I've seen that book. I'm sure I've seen that book. And I, as I told you, I'd sorted out a load of books that were going to go off. And there it was. But it also had a bookmark in it. And the bookmark, I think, was on something like Chapter 8 where, and the title was Where Biology Got It Wrong. And I thought that was quite pertinent as well. <laughs> that was the... Um, the marker I found in when I found that book. So I, and it was, what did I say, 12 years ago that I, no, 2008, I think I bought that book. But um, it seems I'm more ready to listen to the information in it now. So I'm just looking at some reviews from this. You gotta, you gotta listen to this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jeremy Narby's Cosmic Serpent is a densely academic book that's 50% footnotes. This is not light reading, but on the other hand, it is essential reading. Nabi's premise is that hallucinogenic drugs used by shamans in the Western Amazon actually give them access to medicinal information through knowledge coded in DNA. This would be a rather bizarre premise, except for the fact that Nabi is a trained PhD in anthropology and his work is based on an extensive survey of academic materials across numerous disciplines. His journey starts with his experience in the Western Amazon basin where he was invited to try a powerful hallucinogenic called ayahuasca. This compound by itself is mystifying because it's made through a complex chemical process that one would not expect within reach of native Amazonian chemistry. And yet ayahuasca is used throughout the Amazon rainforest as an access to a hallucinatory world where images of spirits inform shamans how to use the hidden power of the plant life in the Amazon rainforest to cure a very broad spectrum of diseases. Only in the past decades of pharmacy pharmaceutical companies invaded this province of these shamans to start mining for botanical compounds to patent to patent sorry and basically steal from the indigenous population more than an anthropological account of how shamans use hallucination hallucination to find cures for diseases the cosmic serpent is a challenge to western rationalism and modern science Nabi calls into serious question the limits of the scientific process and how we came to know things in the industrialized world. His argument is actually quite convincing as he punches holes in rational constructive thinking and makes the case for a completely different and more intuitive platform of knowledge. While many in the scientific world have scoffed at his theories, Jeremy Narby has succeeded in throwing, at least throwing a monkey wrench in the more myth than truth paradigm of science and has opened the door for inquiry 
into what may prove to be the future of human knowledge. Whoa. <laughs> That's a nice review, isn't it? Yes, that is a quite the review. And what was, yeah, what led me to, I wasn't going to talk about that today, but what <laughs> led me to go there was that you, you got the same thing. What was really interesting in that book was they talked about what is the, what is the anesthesia they use on the torso that you inject under the skin? What is that? Lignocaine. Nope. No. Um, there is a, there is a, not, an no. anesthesia. Carare? No. Yes. Yes. Carare. So doctors will use it on operations when you're operating on the torso and it is a anesthesia you inject under the skin. And where they got it from was the Amazonians in, <laughs> in the rainforest and what they do is they have got this stuff from plants. So it is a, so what they do is they shoot monkeys with it they put it on their arrows, these little arrows, and they shoot the monkey with it, goes under the monkey's skin. The monkey falls asleep and <laughs> falls out of the tree and they kill the monkey and they get to eat the monkey. But <laughs> if you ingest it, it doesn't do anything. If you – the only way it works is if you inject it under the skin. So how out of all of these plants in the friggin' Amazon, which there's – 300,000 oh, 800, 800, yeah. plants, different plants. Can they figure out which one will tranquilize the body of an animal without, so it poisons them, but it doesn't poison them. Yeah. So they the meat's the still meat. good to yeah. eat. You can still eat the meat. That's the thing. But it, it anesthetizes the body. So they, they, their limbs yeah. don't work and they fall out of the tree and then you, and you can kill them, but you can still eat the meat. How the oh, hell did they know, figure that out? Yeah. And so drug companies went there in the 40s or 50s or something or other, and they learned how to synthesize one of them, which is the Carreri that they use in anesthesia these days. But the Amazonians have, I think there's like 13 or 14 different ones that no one's ever ever synthesized. But you know, like this yeah. crazy, it's, it's just like with the ayahuasca. So the ayahuasca, out of the 800,000 plants in the Amazon, they take two of them, boil them together and mash them together. And one of them has the DMT, which is the hallucinogen. Yeah. But you cannot absorb it through your stomach. But the other one that they mix with it makes it to where you can absorb it through your stomach. And, and like, you know, they ask the, the, the shamans, so how, how, do you, how did you ever figure out which two out of 800,000 plants to use? And they go, well, the plants told us. Yes. <laughs> I just love it. I love it. And they can't deny it, you know, try and describe it. There's no way they could have um, tried every combination. And like you said, to know to inject under or, you know, with the ayahuasca to boil it up. The two, it's just, they had to have the knowledge from somewhere else. Yeah, how, but how would they even know that the the... So the only way you could figure out that ayahuasca would give you these these visions is if you could ingest it, mm. but you can't ingest it's, it unless you mix it with this other. Pl like it's impossible. I know. I know. To I come know. up with that. There's so many trial permutations. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's impossible to come up with that through trial and error. So, like, where's yeah, where's it come from? Where's it come from? Well, we've been told. The plants have told them. The plants have told us. Um, so, yeah, so when you said about the... the shimmery thingies. The shimmering cross things, it sounded a lot like that. That's so, yeah, it, if anybody it? wanted a rabbit hole to go down, the cosmic serpent is a... Um, and what, I found it very, read. very easy to read, you know, what they, he was saying there. I found it really easy to read that he writes in a lovely way. And you know what? He's actually... He started researching the guys that figured out DNA in the first place and Crick, so it was Watson and Crick, wasn't mm -hmm. it? The Crick guy actually wrote back in the 50s basically the same thing. Yes, yes. And then Saying it, that, yeah. that, that all Indigenous people had knowledge, knowledge of. of DNA. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it, it's, it's kind of, think about, say, 
Australian Aboriginals never really went beyond the Stone Age, never got to the Iron Age or the Bronze Age or any of that stuff. But if you think about a boomerang, yes. that is advanced aeronautical engineering. Yeah. In order for a boomerang to work, they had to understand advanced mm. Yeah, and it's the same, you know, with the pyramids and the Stonehenge. They don't know how. They've done various experiments and they've got theories, but they don't actually know. I have a, I've been thinking about this, as you do, and I've, my feeling is that the information to do all of these things is in the field and has been in the field for as long as humanity has existed, so 300, 400,000 years, however long. But and Kathy means... The field of consciousness, oh, sorry, not, yeah. <laughs> not not the field that where, where the where guys the cows saw the, are. The, yeah. yeah, not the field where the cows are, <laughs> even though that's part of it. But yeah. exactly, yeah. So you the unified field, the zero point field, or the vacuum fluctuation field, are the three names I know it by. And I've really thought about this, and I believe that the information has always been there, but it's when the awareness of humanity has reached a point where it can access that information and it means something because I think it was what Leonardo da Vinci he did drawings of submarines and of helicopters and that was sort of four three four hundred years before they were created he must have had that information from somewhere even though it wasn't you know there weren't there weren't um, researchers out there trying to make it so I think we add to the field but there's also that knowledge is there all the time and it's whether we access it and whether the human at that moment has that potential and that awareness to use that information so that if you sort of gave the stone age man the information to make a rocket to go to mars or whatever he wouldn't understand it but that that's been the gradual um evolution of understanding and then they get the information where did einstein get all this stuff from from the field and he was in the right place at the right time to do it you know, it's really interesting about people like Einstein and Tes uh, Tesla. Um, you know, the, the stuff that, it's just our education system, like the stuff that we get told about them is all the straight, boring, sciencey mm -hmm. stuff. But those guys were into the woo like nobody's mm -hmm. business, especially Tesla. He was into some wackadoodle stuff. That's not wackadoodle, but you know what I mean? I, I totally, I know. But that's the thing. Why? Because they don't want you, and I mean, I'm not going to go making it try and sound like conspiracy theory or anything like that, but there are certain trains of thought that society, whatever it is, wants you to follow. And all of yeah. that stuff is there unless you go digging, like reading The Cosmic Serpent, you'll never hear about it. Nobody, no, no sort of... Um, pharmaceutical company would say to you, oh yeah, well, the, the, you know, we found that plant compound because the shaman talked to the plant and found it. It's all about, you know, how they create it in the lab and that's it. So yeah, I think we have to widen our scope, widen our research in that respect. Yeah. So what I was going to get to you, I was, I was actually going to talk to you about um, that valley that you're in. Mm-hmm. And so I'm currently reading a book called Fire in the Head, and it's about... Oh, yeah. Is that one you showed me, the Celtic? Yes. It's about uh, Celtic shamanism is what it's about. In that, it was talking about how the Celtic people, you know, where they roamed to, where they, where they were, and then who attacked them and pushed them where. And when the Romans you know, took over, they pushed them all to like the, the, the western mm -hmm. highlands of Scotland and the western side of Wales, which mm -hmm. is where you are. Mm. There's a surprise. So <laughs> these were the last holdouts of the indigenous Celtic myst mysticisms, mm. so to speak, where, whereas Christianity had taken over all the rest of it. And so I was just wondering about, you know, I remember you telling me that you're the, you know, where you live right there is a bit of a hotbed of some, you know, maybe weird stuff. And I'm thinking maybe that because, the, you know, like, like I said, Western Wales is one of the holdouts of, mm. of the 
a regional, you know, Celtic mysticism. What do you think about that idea? I think it's very true in that there are a lot of um, structures like, you know, we've got the um, crop mark in our field. All along the western side, you've got that, that's ancient culture is there. There's lots of different um, um, tumuli and um, standing stones. And that that's something I don't know about in the sense that the the ancient tribes of Great Britain, you don't learn about them. It all becomes the, you know, the Saxons and the Vikings and, and the invaders and the Romans. And the actual indigenous people of these islands, very little is known about them. And I know I have a friend who studies them and she could name off the different tribes. But I do believe that they're there is a strong culture that existed and that it's still there within the Celtic. But the Celts, you see, and again, my knowledge is not extensive uh, on this at all. It is the Western fringes, but you also have into Brittany and Normandy in France, their languages Mm. are very similar. So then you have Cornwall and then uh, Devon, then through Wales and then up through Scotland. And in fact, some of the words, it's quite interesting, in Iceland are the same as in Welsh. For, for window, I went to visited Iceland and it was like, oh my God. And it's, but it's the same in French as well. And that all fascinates me as well, that, you know, the root of the language and, and how these words are, are very similar, showing there must be some commonality at some, at some level between them. But yeah, I, I definitely think that what you said, that the culture got pushed westwards. And that's why they built Offa's Dyke, which is um, um, an earth mound that runs between England and Wales, right from North Wales all the way down to South Wales, is to keep the <laughs> keep the heathens out. You know, it was to keep us in Wales and everybody else. Was it a bit like Hadrian's Wall sort of thing? Yeah, but a much, <laughs> an, an earth one, not nearly as much. An posh. earth one, yeah. Um, uh, but that you know, there is that feature that right, keep them out of the way. Mm, so in in one of my favourite books, um, Stealing Fire, they talk mm. about Stephen Cutler talks about the 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 beyond the pale, and that's, that's where it. that paling yeah. fence was. There, so that was the paling fence was on top of that earth of mound. The what's the mound? What's the mound called? Offer Offer's Dyke O double F A. Offer's Dyke. Yeah, really, and there's still quite a lot of it you know um, standing you can find it some of it how tall is it probably about 12 foot in places oh don't oh, quote wow. me again you know but yeah. it's it's hard to see in some places it's quite clear in some places it's disappeared but the right. the actual root of it is still marked you know that it, it was a it's a, a feature it's definitely you can find it you know it's funny so the the farm i grew up on in australia was 1200 acres and so uh, we didn't own it dad just worked there and so you know he worked on the farm and so we had a little cottage that we lived in and dad worked there for 45 years or something like that. but when he so the town i grew up in it was, is called young but its original name was lambing flat mm-hmm. and there was a gold rush there in the 1800s and young is the site of a um it was really a race riot at the time. All the Chinese, there was a lot of Chinese that would come there to work the diggings, and the the Europeans didn't like the Chinese, and and uh, there was actually a like a race riot there. They 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 uh, had a thing called the they read the riot, what's called the Riot Act. Anyway, mm. that all the the European miners attacked the the, the Chinese, Chinese miners, but so the the the. The gold mining was in what this is the kind of the center of town now, um, but the European miners wouldn't let the Chinese miners have access to any water oh. to sluice for gold. <laughs> yeah, and so the Chinese diverted water from about five to six miles away. And this is the country I'm from. It's it's very rolling hills, like mm-hmm. up and down hills sort of thing. It's not they're not steep hills, but they're a lot of hills. And they diverted water from five or six miles away into the gold fields. Mm. And so they started. So this is this is without any, you know, ge- uh, geological survey or anything like th- that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But they started in a place 
to where they got the water to run downhill through all this stuff. Anyway, it ran through the middle of the place I grew up on. And when Dad first started working there, which would have been the early 60s, yeah. um, he said it was 12 feet deep in some places. Good God, and they brought that water down? Yeah, and, and, and some places it was an inch deep. But it okay. was where the water, they, and how he said how they supposedly dug it was like a, like a, a branch of a tree, you know, like three feet long. And then they, du- they hollowed it out like a canoe. Mm-hmm. And they would just put water in it and just move it back and forth and see where, how, how to get it to run downhill. But, Aye, that's good. Um, but anyway, he, the first four or five years he was there, he spent, he, he spent most of the time on the tractor with the bucket of the tractor filling this thing in. Mm, yes. To make like flat farming yeah, land, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. That's what the bo- the guy that owned the place had him doing. Nowadays, it would be a, 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 a national, you know, a national monument. historical yeah, yeah. Uh, monument. And he can show you parts of it that he didn't fill in that are that are still there because they're just a little dip in the ground or whatever. Yeah, but yeah, it it actually ran through that. That's- it, it's, that reminds me of here because um, this area I live in here is very big lead mining. The lead mm. ore was, and, and silver was there as well, but more lead. And we've got, right next to the house, there was a big lead mine. And what fascinates me is how they connected all the tunnels. So you have adits going in and shafts going straight down. And there is a network. I mean, I've got books with the plans, and they sometimes go through the hill and come out on the other valley but everything meets up and Mm. that blows my brain because everything was done by hand you know there was nothing there and in fact the only time I have used physics that I learned in school was to work out how deep a shaft was because there's a um, I think it's called a displacement equation it's v squared minus u squared equals 2as and basically you can throw a stone up and it'll reach it'll stop you know And then gravity takes it down. And from the timing that it goes down, you can actually work out how how deep uh, the shafts are. And they are deep. They are very deep. Um, But it's the, you know, now when you look at channel tunnels and things like that with all of the, the computerized stuff and how they did it, I just don't know. I mean, I think there was a great expenditure of um, manpower, you know, lives doing it because they they were running for about 200 years at least here. And lead isn't the best thing to be (laughs) mining at the best of times. But it's just the way they manage to meet these shafts that go really deep and long into mountains. And then they get the, the adits go in and the shafts come down and everything meets up perfectly. I just beyond my comprehension. The, how they did it same with you know like you're talking how they worked out and these they brought water down from um lakes up above us and you can still see they had like a wooden box is the best way i can describe it mm-hmm. and it, yep. they had it came, coming along the mountain uh, along the hillside and and that came all the way i don't know mile two miles to bring water to the mine yeah you can still see that up in the sierra mountains here in california uh, when you go up towards Lake Tahoe, you can see there's still wooden, the wooden, yeah, water water channels along that they, because there's a lot of mining up there too. Like the Comstock mine was up there, and um, Sutter Creek Gold Rush, and yeah, lots of lots of mining stuff there. No, it's it's really cool, bloated, but <laughs> how they did it, I don't know. Yeah, so your little valley, um, you know, it's a bit of a holdout, maybe for some of that old Celtic mysticism, but you've, you've also told me that there's a lot of, you know, like, so over on the coast, 45 minutes from where we are is Santa Cruz and Santa Cruz is like Weirdsville of California. You can, <laughs> you can go to Santa Cruz and, you know, you can find some weird woo woo person to do almost anything to, you know, mm-hmm. the channel the spirit of a 2000 year old Egyptian princess or whatever it is you want to do. Um, <laughs> there's a bit of that sort of stuff around where you are. Like I know you've said, oh, I met this person who said this and, and you know, like there's quite yeah, a bit of I interesting stuff around where you are too. There, there, there's definitely, and there's certain areas, you know, you can go to certain um, villages and towns where you know that there's going to be a lot of um, alternative, 
put it that way. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and then we have some, we've got Happy Valley further north where, you know, there's teepees and all sorts of people live there. Um, yeah, it is, I think you're right. It, the whole of the western coast is a bit of an enclave for little areas of alternative stuff. So I'm in my element, obviously. Like, this is the obviously, reason I yeah. came here. But <laughs> Yeah, but since I started reading this, this book the other day, it kind of made me think about why that why that is uh, even though it might not be celtic alternative stuff all of it mm. but if that was a if that was a holdout of you know some of that old knowledge those old ways the paganism and the, you know mm. all that sort of sort of stuff i wonder if that's got something to do with the you know like, like there's there's the possibility of something being handed down and handed down and handed down. Santa Cruz there's not. Yeah. Because 200 years ago, Santa Cruz is inhabited by the Ohlone Indians. But then you know what you I mean? There's none of them left around. But like, no, but like, then you don't know what the energy of the area is. That's the other thing I'm looking at there. When you said about them, you know, pushing everybody west and Santa Cruz and places like that, and there's Sedona, I think, in Arizona, that's meant to be a, a quite an energetic place. Yeah, There's a is. guy called um, Konstantin Korotov. He's a Russian and he's developed, um, I can't think of the name of the actual machine, but basically he, you, it shows your, all the different colours and your energy around your body. And he ha- he's shown that he can predict by the um, energy that's shown on his machine if somebody's going to, uh, say, got a heart complaint or something like that. And mm-hmm. he's a really big one on going to all these different areas and studying the energy. I think Greg Braden does it as well. And, and Nassim Haramein, he does it as well. He goes to like the Egyptian, he goes to Mexico because of the energy of the area. And I think what we might be looking at here is Santa Cruz, yes, it might have had a, you know, um, um, First Peoples Nation there, but that might be why, that there's an energy within the earth, within the area that is conducive to doing all of that stuff. That's why people get um, drawn to it. There's a place up in the Santa Cruz Mountains, just above Santa Cruz, called the Mystery Spot. <laughs> and it's it's like a bit of a vortex to where you can put a ball on the ground and it'll roll uphill. Oh, yeah, I've heard about this. But, yeah, carry on. I don't know. Um, yeah, every, everything... Every, like your perception is is kind of slightly skewed there, and and uh, yeah, it's it's called the mystery spot. Mm. And is that that's obviously an op- optical illusion? Because I know there's a road I think in this country the same the same sort of thing that you think you're going downhill when you're going uphill or vice versa, and it is an actual optical illusion about the way the land is, but the the eye can't perceive it. The eye thinks it's going a different way. So you go, how is that car rolling up that hill? But it's actually running down, but yeah, there, there's definitely it's about now. I think I think compasses don't work there. Oh really? Okay, so mm. we're talking the very mystery spot, yeah, the Bermuda like Triangle magnetic... mystery spot. Yes, I think so. I you know, and I could be totally, you know, it could be just an optical illusion. And there's all these stories about it, but yeah, it, there is one of those over there in. Yeah, but I always think you know, like here in the valley. And Stonehenge and places like that. Why were they built where they were built? What was the, what was the, why? I know that, you know, they say they lined up um, astrologically with all the, the, you know, the astronomy and, and everything like that. But you could do that technically anywhere. Why were they built? What was, what was the reason? What did they feel? Why? How did they know? Well, isn't there? Isn't the stones at Stonehenge actually from Wales? Yeah, they're from the Preselis, the blue stone from Preseli, which is in Pembrokeshire. And that's the thing that they they've tried to recreate to get those size stones there. Now, obviously, they could have massive manpower, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people doing it. But they tried to get it down onto the Bristol Channel, and then put it on some kind of boat like they might have had then and sail up the Bristol Channel till they were nearly at Stonehenge and then it wouldn't be far to go over the, you know, go over land and they sunk the first time. This was, you know, 15 years ago they tried and went, right. they actually sank. 
Um, they did manage to get pretty near it, but uh, there's lots of different theories that you know about those stones. But they are meant to have come from the Procellis, and again, why? And they're just the the horizontal stones on top, aren't they? They're not the vertical ones. I don't. I think all of the big stones are the Procelli blue. Oh, really? Yeah, my understanding is, but mm. again, don't quote me, because all of those big ones had to be carried, moved down there. So what were the properties of that stone that they needed? And again, we're looking at the west of the country. Yes, once again, yeah, it's in the west. So, yeah, who knows? But, yeah, there's so much stuff we don't know, I isn't know. there? It's so fascinating. I'm going to have to read that book now <laughs> that you keep pro- uh, quoting from. <laughs> Which one? The one you just said about the Celtic fire, was it? Oh, oh, Fire in the Head. Fire yes. in the Hills or whatever it's called. Fire in the Head, yes. Head um, or Hills? Head. Oh, Fire in the Head, okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. Good, if I get the title right. You get the title right. So tell us about what are you, um, what are you doing these days? <laughs> <laughs> I'm having fun. Um, yeah, no, work has, it's evolved. I've, that's the only word I can say. I've had an evolution. So when I started right from the very start with Reiki and everything, it was my goal was helping people heal. And the healing was generally of a um, physical nature, you know, or a mental. It was a, there was with the body. And then gradually that perception widened out to all levels, you know, mental, physical, um, emotional and spiritual healing. And then... I think I've known this all along for about the last 10 years, but I realise this work is also about helping people realise their potential. And you could say it's a bit of a chicken and egg, that if you heal, does that help you find your potential? And if you find your potential, does that help you heal? And I think it works both ways. So where I'm at now is I really want to show people that they have an internal innate power and it's everybody has it you know this is very very what we're talking about with the shamans because it's the power to heal the power to connect the power to create and the power to find your purpose and potential and that's where I feel my work is going now with the 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 healing inverted commas I don't do any healing it's helping the system I'm working with heal But once somebody moves into um, a place of balance, then it becomes easier for all of the other things to happen. But I also think it's the other way around because, you know, Stephen Kotler's book, um, The Art of Impossible, he has a great chapter in there about helping you find your purpose and all of the um, science behind what happens in your brain when you achieve something or when you're studying a subject that has relevance to you there's dopamine and you think well why would that be but it's obvious in some ways because it's giving you that um, impetus to carry on and of course when you get the dopamine and the other biochemistry you help your body it goes into a better place biochemically so for me the finding of your purpose is as important inverted commas as the finding the balance I mean it's all one big thing And people sort of say, well, I can't find my um, purpose. How do I find it? And the first stage for me is curiosity. What makes you curious? What piques your interest? What makes you, you know, if you see something on TV, you go, oh, that's interesting. And that for me would be where you'd start. And then you might see what relevance has that got? How does that react with something else? You can think big, you know, Stephen Kotler goes into this in in far greater detail, but it's that to me, the whole thing is my passion now. And my I know this is my purpose is to help people find that place of balance where they can access all of their innate power. This isn't anything woo woo in that sense. It's something we all possess and, and it's just culture that has shut it down. You know, the, the shamans know it, the, all the native people know it. So for me, it's, you know, people think about, I can't heal myself. And I'll say to them, well, when you cut your hand, do you have to sit there and go, right, I need prothrombin, then I need thrombin, then I need 
fibrinogen, that will be go to fibrin and then I need platelets and that will form the, the, you know, the clot. No, your body knows it instinctively. And for me, it can, it can heal on every level like that. And I'm not knocking modern medicine in any way, shape or form. We learn everything for a reason, but it's what we do with it that's important. So for me, modern medicine has done a massive, amazing job and continues to do so. And there's millions, if not billions of people who've benefited from it. But we have given up responsibility of our health to a greater or lesser extent to the pharmaceuticals because we've been taught the doctor will make you better. So that's where I'm at. I've got a course going out now, which is hopefully, so people were asking me, can you teach me what you do? And I was thinking, I can't because it's me and I can't teach somebody to be me because of all my experience. So I started looking at what are the principles behind what I do. And it's things like awareness, perception, no judgment, energy, the field, you know, and, and so I am just started that and got the first course running with five beautiful ladies all around the world who I'm so ever so grateful for, for trusting me enough to come on the first course. Um, so, yeah, that's where I'm at. You know, the, the example you give of if you cut your hand, mm. you don't have to heal it. It's the body's a self-healing yeah. Organism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just, it's a really interesting way of looking at that. Yeah, well, it's, to me, it's, it, that's something we accept because we see it every day. But when you think of the cells within the body, like within the gut, some of them change every hour, every day, every seven days. I think they say that the majority of the body renews every seven years where the some of the bones I think are the, the longest and some may not actually change I'm not going to don't quote me on that but I know a vast majority there's a massive turnover so for me if you can step into the mindset of healing yourself then like Dr Joe Dispenza when he had that smash you know he describes it at the beginning of the book where he had that bad car smash and his back was so badly smashed that he said, you're going to have to have rods put into your spine because you will never walk otherwise. And he lay there and he taught himself to meditate, to think about those bones mending and how hard work it was and how he'd only get three minutes done and he wanted to go longer and longer and longer and eventually he could do it. And he mended his body. If you can sit there and, and envisage your muscle getting bigger, and you can get a 13% growth of your bicep just by thinking as though you're doing the exercise, not moving it at all. Why can't you do the rest with your body, you know, to help heal? That's where I'm at. Yeah, I don't know if you remember Jonathan Field's podcast, but he, he so Jonathan had his hand basically cut off. And when he was in hospital, um, with all the recovery from that, he would sit there and he said he'd do it eight to ten hours a day mm. and he would mentally picture his tendons and everything reconnecting and his hand, you wouldn't know there was anything wrong with his hand. No. Uh, today. And that's, that's, yeah. And I just want, that's so powerful in me that I really want people to understand their innate power. And that they're magnificent. They're all unique. Everybody is unique. Everybody has a different purpose, gift, energy. And it all is pertinent and it all is perfect. Sorry, I'm on my soapbox now. You're on your soapbox. You, <laughs> you go, girlfriend. <laughs> oh, dear. No, I'm lucky because I know, know <clears throat> finally where I'm at and what I'm doing. So in this, in this past year since you were uh, on the podcast and you've started um, connecting with a wider audience and stuff, mm -hmm. have you had any really crazy um, happenings? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's two. There's, there's two that happened within two weeks in July this year that totally left me gobsmacked, Okay. And that was two ladies. One was in America, one was in Sweden. As usual, they'd had a session and they didn't know, I didn't know anything why they wanted it. I just did the session. Didn't know anything that had happened. 
you know, I don't ask. I have asked recently because I'm interested. I, I, some people have got in contact in, in relation to an um, email I sent out. But as a whole, I never ask what's wrong and I never ask what changes. If people choose to get in touch with me afterwards, that's absolutely wonderful and it's fantastic to hear. But um, I did do a, a post about this, so you might have seen it. But somebody I can remember on your podcast I can, fairly recently was talking about being hit around the head by a four by two by the universe. You know, when you don't see the message. And so the message comes around again and it comes around again. And she, I think it was the lady, she sort of said, yeah, it was like being the universe hitting me around the head by a four, with a four by two as much as they have you got the message yet? So what happened with me was I had two emails within two weeks from these two ladies and they used the same phrase in both of them, even though they were completely separate. And it said, thank you, Kathy, you've given me my life back, which is just, you know, floored me. And obviously they'd done the change, OK, hopefully facilitated by what I did, but whatever. And one lady had had a really bad allergic um, a reaction to any mould in water and that had gone away. And she'd met, she sent me these lovely photos of her taking her horse down to the pond which was what she'd always wanted to do. And she said she'd managed, you know, she, she'd she never been able to do that the other, at all. And the other lady had been, I think, suffering from something like chronic fatigue syndrome and not been in a good place for you know a few years. And she said that, I think the day after the session, she suddenly had this energy and everything was, she, she could enjoy life again and, she just said exactly the same words. You've given me your life back. You've given me my life back. And how blessed am I to be able to do anything work-wise that brings back that, you know, people get that uh, result out of it. But they've done the change, not me. Yeah, it's always fun to hear um, stories like that. Mm, it is. <laughs> it, but I called it a hug from the universe. So it wasn't a four by two, it was a hug. It was a hug. It was the hug for the universe, because the universe was going, there you go, girl. <laughs> so that was good. And horses, you know, I've had people report back, the horses have changed from being really um, upset, you know, anxious and stuff. And, and everybody's noticed, they've just suddenly chilled out. So I'm working on, the reason I got in touch with people to say, um, if you've, if you've experienced a change after a session, let me, you know, three questions. Why, why did you come to me? What did you experience and what changed? Um, and I, I'm feeling here we're going to go right down to the nervous system. It's all about the nervous system. Because nearly everybody was remarking about how the change in the way they felt and if you think that stress and everything like that can cause all of these disability, you know, all of these illnesses and autoimmune and things like that, you can see how if you can help the nervous system come back into regulation, then the, the symptoms are going to disappear. So it's just a theory I'm working on at the moment. Well, you know, there's a lot of, lots and lots and lots of conversations about you know, disease is just dis ease, ease yeah. in the body, and and yeah, when you get when you're living in constant states of stress and things that you that you're not designed to live that way. Mm. Uh, yeah, I don't, the the thing I look at now is when you know a lot of people don't listen to the news at the moment. You know, and I know we've got a lot of sad news over here as well with it dear old queen but um it's there's a lot of things that are reported that you can't do anything about and that's where i think the the sublim subliminal stress really piles up so when you hear of a fire you know in australia or um, the flooding that was in pakistan it's a you think oh my goodness but there's nothing you can do about it so, you, you know, you have to have a particular mindset to be able to not let that affect you. Still right. be, you know, and you don't want to be the hard hearted or I'm not going to, I'm just going to ignore everybody. But I do think that that's quite a, you know, they say with cancer now that 
it's gone from one in four to one in two people. Why? It's not just a, a better diagnosis. The, the, you know, that's what right. I say. It, it, yeah. it is something that's happening in the environment, whether it's the food, the lack of exercise, you know, stress, whatever. There's something happening. And what really interests me is that with cancer, it's the only thing where they look at curing it there's far more money put into curing it than into preventing it. Because if you think that when COVID came, straight there's away... There's no money in the prevention. Oh, exactly. I'm sorry. There's no oh, money know, in the I prevention. Know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I remember I know. watching that. It was a, I think it was a Chris Rock comedy skit, probably 15 years ago. But he's like, there ain't no money in the yeah. cure. Yeah. There's money in the prevention. No, I mean, the other way around, the, yeah. The other way around, sorry. Yeah. Because they don't want to cure you. No. They want to cure you. They They want you to live with it. Yeah, I know. And I don't want to be cynical because I do realise that pharmaceuticals help many, many people. But I've been digging into this. This is a subject that I am going to write about. And it is quite frightening. It is absolutely... In in Great Britain, you know, there's a, a substance over here called Calpol which is the paracetamol su- suspension for children. I don't know if you have the same sort of thing in the States, that if, you, if your child was ill, you'd give them a spoonful of it. And it's a, a, just paracetamol, but in a suspension. They worked out over here that every day they were selling 5.2 tonnes of the stuff every day in this country because people were using it um, not just for fever and pain, but, oh, your child's not quite right give them some cowpole. And the advertising was about, oh, bringing your child back to, so the child was a little bit upset, give it some cowpole. And when the parents were, they they went to one woman's house and she had about, I don't know, she must've gone through 20 bottles in a month and she didn't realize how, what she was doing. And this is the thing we just put into this culture of the pill, you know, any kind of tablet or pill will make you better. And that's what I'm trying to sort of real, you know, help people realise that there is another way. And not to say you might not need pharmaceuticals sometimes. You know, Robin and I haven't had real television for a few years now. <laughs> um, whatever real television. I was going to say you with, had pretend, with, yeah. <laughs> with, with ads on it. And yeah. I don't know what it is, whether it's maybe Amazon Prime or... Well, but there's... The stuff we've been watching that has ads on it, mm. and I don't know if it's that way in England or not, but here in America, like every ad is for some sort of prescription drug, and the the list of side effects oh. <laughs> is worse than the thing that you're trying to fix in the first place. But every ad is one. I mean, and I spent years not hearing these things, you know, yeah. and then. You, and you just, we, Rob and I kind of got to where we would play a game while watching TV <laughs> to where when an ad came on and they listed all the side effects, when they stopped talking, one of us had to add one more. And like <laughs> one ad, it was my turn and one ad, it was, it was Robin's, Robin's turn, you know. Yeah. And so, you know, it might say side effects include this and 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 this. And when they stopped and Robin would turn and say, and blood coming from your eyeballs <laughs> or something like that. You know what I mean? Like we just played this little game to where you, you had to come up with, an with extra, another, side, an extra side, another effect. side effect. And you know what? It didn't matter how stupid a side effect you came up with. It was no weirder than the ones they've just listed. I know. I, I, this is the frightening thing. The best time I ever um, heard this talked about was there's a guy called Jason Vale. We over in the UK do not have ads for prescription drugs. I think it's banned, you know, that they don't do it. Um, oh, really? Yeah, no, there's nothing, because I know in your country there is. But this was a program about um, juicing and how it can be good for the health. And this guy, Jason Vale, is called the Juice Master. And he took eight people away for 28 days, and all they had was juice. And they had a variety of complaints ranging from Crohn's disease to high blood pressure, whatever. There was a little Welsh man there, and he was very ill and he had a suitcase with him that was full of his drugs for that month. And he was taking 56 tablets a day. And halfway through the program, Jason Vale asked everybody to take out the insert from the drugs they were taking and read it. 
Well, this little Welsh man, he was so funny. He was going, well, Juju, he said, look at this, look at this, there's stroke and there's, there's blood clots. And he said, there's death. He said, you could die from taking these drugs. And then he burst out laughing because underneath it, it said, if you suffer from any of these side effects, please report them to your doctor. <laughs> if you die, <laughs> yeah, if you yeah, die, yeah. just let your doctor know that you died. <laughs> oh, and do you know, then he did the 28 days and you saw him leaving and he said, well, folks, he said, I've still got my suitcase. And everyone thought, oh, and he brought a suitcase out that was the size of a matchbox and he was down to that number of drugs. Really? Yeah, no, he did really well. So it was that was a, a really good example. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've, I'm not going to get into that too much because it's I really do get on my soapbox with that one. Well, it's just, you know, this is, it, it's just like the book we talked about before, the Jeremy Narby's book, The Cosmic Serpent. Once you... Once you start looking outside the confines of the stories we've been told by society mm -hmm. and start looking at other things, then, then there's no end to like... Where you can go. Where you can go and nothing's off limits and, and yeah, it's just, it's just interesting when you start looking at things. When you look, change the way you look at things? Yeah, the things look at but that's where the... the what you were saying about all of those side effects. I've been trying to think of an analogy to show because they say the energy work, which really confuses me that science does not look at energy as a form of um, helping people when we are energy, which is quantum physics fact. You know, that really confuses me. But like you said, they're not going to make money out of that. But if you, uh, the way I look at it is if you had a walnut and you wanted to open that walnut without damaging the nut, then complementary alternative medicine would be gently prising the nut open. It might take a bit longer, but you'd open the nut up, you'd get the nut out in one piece and there'd be no side effects. Modern medicine can be, you get a sledgehammer, you bang it, and you yes, it opens up, but the nut is in goodness knows how many pieces, which to me is the side effects, because I've yet to find a drug that hasn't got side effects. And why they're called side effects, they are actually effects. They're just not as prevalent, maybe, as the actual effect they want to, it to do. But again, that's another story. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's like I said, we was saying a minute ago, it's just, I don't know, once you're down the, you know, we talk about the rabbit hole, but once you're down the rabbit hole, all, all it is, I think it's just looking outside the cultural norms that we've been yeah, we've got to have a change of emphasis and a, a realisation that we've been programmed not in a, you know, that sounds like it's some, you know, mind altering thing. But I grew up with the statement, the doctor will make you better. That was what I was told. If I was ill, the doctor will make you better. And how many people have said that they feel ill, they go to the doctor, they sit in the waiting room, by the time they get into the doctor, they feel better. Et voila, we have the placebo effect. They've gone to the doctor and the doctor's made them better. They don't need the drug. Why they don't use placebo, I don't know. They say it's unethical. Really? Yeah, and, but, but that's, that's getting better by thinking about things a certain way. But then there's the, the other one, which is getting worse. The nocebo. Well, the, it's, it's about getting worse when thinking things. You know, like some... <laughs> really bugs me, I think I've talked about on the podcast before, is if you look at the front of any cooking magazine mm. or any women's magazine, the words guilt-free recipe mm. will be on there. And, and so what they're saying is we're going to replace something that was in this recipe with something that you should not feel guilty for eating. But the thing that you were eating, you should feel, feel guilty, guilty for. About. Yeah. You should feel guilty for that. So if you if you eat something and you tell yourself it's bad for you, and like in like in Australia, I think that with the like Australian Aborigines, the story we were always told is like if the 
the shaman or the medicine man or whatever, he points the bone at you, mm. you die. Mm. They all knew that if the bone gets pointed at you, you die. And so if the bone gets pointed at you, you die. You die. Mm-hmm. And I think it's the same thing with, with brainwashing women into thinking that this food is bad for you. And, and you're supposed to feel guilty yeah. for, for eating it. You know what I mean? And so it's bad for you because you've been told it's bad for you. Yeah. Right. It's kind of like in, um, so I think it was in Dr. Joe Dispenza's book, You Are the Placebo. He talks mm. a lot about uh, the placebo effect. And, you know, they talk about, you know, people with arthritic knees and they do a fake operation on them. So they do an operation. They don't fix the knee. Mm. But then there's no pain after that. But they also talked about a guy who was diagnosed with some sort of internal organ cancer and they said there's no cure for it, you're going to die. And so, you know, three or four months later he died and they did an autopsy and there's nothing wrong with him. He died because he was told he was going to die. No SIBO that is, isn't it? And and you you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, it's just... But they, you see, that, that is another uh, example of the power of the brain, which I know we're talking about here, uh, that if you add all of these examples up, you'll see the power that we have within us to do these things, that you can do it to a negative or you can do it to a positive. Right. And it's, it's the... It just drives me mad because I, I had a friend who got diagnosed with cancer and she told me, I went into the hospital to see her And she said she'd been to see the consultant. And the first thing he said to her, the very first thing, he said, of course, Mrs. Jones, you know that you'll never be cancer free. Well, if I'd have been in that room with him, I might have hit him. Because if you, there are ways of telling people that, yes, we've got a journey ahead of us and things like that. And I can't make any guarantees. But to tell somebody who's come to the doctor at long last, because she had a hell of a time getting there, and be told you'll never be cancer free, what are you setting up in their brain? What, what, what expectation are you giving them? You're not giving them any hope or anything to actually get rid of it. You're setting them into that mindset. And I think that is something that should really be looked at. And of course, now in, we live in a culture where there's blame, there's a claim that if the doctor should dare to say, so I know they feel their hands are tied, but there are ways of saying things. He could have said, we've got a journey ahead of us and we've got all these different things we can try, you know. But to, to, just to say that, and the interesting thing, uh, Warwick, was I went in there and I gave her two books. I gave her Anita Morjani's Dying to Be Me, where she has spontaneous um, curing from cancer just about the day she's meant to die and she comes through it. And also Dr. Joe's um, You Are the Placebo. And I left them with her. And she said the nurses could not read the placebo book fast enough. They were almost arguing over which one was going to have it next. So I left a copy in the in the ward. <laughs> so I don't know if it will do any good, but Dr. Joe's placebo book is in the cancer ward. That's a good place to put it too. Mm, well, I thought he couldn't do any harm. Planting a seed. And so, you know, thinking about, um, you know, what we're talking about here and talking about positivity and stuff like that, um, I know you are going to join us in san antonio for the <laughs> yes. for the uh journey on podcast summit coming up in november so for you guys who don't know about that we're having a, a journey on podcast summit so some of the guests from the first year of the podcast are going to be all joining us for this summit so kathy's coming kerry lake's coming elsa sinclair is coming uh mark rashad mark's wife chrissy uh Jim Masterson, uh, Rupert Isaacs is now coming <laughs> over from Germany for that. Um, Kerry Lake, did I say Kerry Lake? Yeah. Kerry Jane Kugler, Pike, um, Leslie Jane Desmond. Pike, Leslie Desmond, Je- Jessica Whiteplume. Gillian Crime. Um, Gillian Crimebring, Shay Stewart, Suki Baxter. Terry Kubler. Yes, all, all the amazing people from the first. Uh, oh, uh, Josh Nichols Nickel. coming in from Canada. Yeah. Um, Sarah Schlotti, she's going to be there. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, Dr. it's just... Dr. Steve, he's coming. Dr. Peters. Steve Peters, he's going to be there. So it's going to be, uh, 
yeah, it's gonna be one of those things <laughs> like, uh, yeah, j- just <laughs> the the energy in the place is gonna be so cool, and not just with the presenters, but the type of people that want to come and listen to that want to like come that. and listen to that. Like, I think the energy is gonna be off the charts there. I can't just, wait. Um, She's not going to be presenting, but she's going to be there. Christine Dixon, <laughs> like her podcast came out about two weeks ago and I probably have had more feedback about her podcast than probably any of them or at least as much as any of them. And Christine's going to be there, so she will be uh, so fun to catch up with. But, yeah, I, I imagine you are – Quite looking forward to that little experience. Just, just a little. I, I'm, I'm likening it to a smogger's board, where you have all these beautiful treats just laid out in front of you. And what I love about the way that you've designed it is that nobody, everyone is speaking individually, so everybody can see everybody. You haven't got to make a choice. There's not sort of two rooms with different right, speakers. Yes. I love yeah. the way you've done that. I'm so grateful because I, for one, am going to be at every. Sp- <laughs> yeah. And so what we're doing is we're going to have every, all the presenters, like there's 22 of them, uh, do what we're calling, it's, it's based on a TED talk, mm-hmm. and, but we're calling it TikTok, which is, uh, what's the T? Teach, tea? inspire and connect. Thank you. Is Teach, it? inspire, okay. connect. connect. And yeah. so they're going to do like a 20 minute TED talk, TED style talk. And it's basically the guts of the message you have to deliver to the world. What? You got twenty minutes to impress upon the world what what you believe is the most important thing. Hit it! So everybody's doing one of those, and then we're going to have some um, group sessions to where we have you know four or five people together, and they're going to talk about a certain uh, okay. topic. What are you? Who are you? Who are you on a panel? With? <laughs> oh, I'm so happy. I mean, I would have gone on any group, but I'm on uh, questions about energy. Kel Surprise. Um, and I am with Dr. Susan Fay, Gillian Craneberg, 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 Bring. Craneberg. I can never say a word. I'm sorry, Gillian. And also um, Terry Kubler. Oh, really? <laughs> so, yeah, that'll be. I'm quite happy to sit in the corner and just listen to them. <laughs> mm. Yeah, so that'll be good. So, you know, the, the, the podcast summit sold out in the first week when we released it, like six months ago or whatever. But we are going to have a live, live streaming and viewing afterwards option. And I think that has just gone on sale. I think if you go to our website, you can probably sign up sign up there. So, um, yeah, it's going to be. Yeah, that I'm really. Oh, I keep sort of trying to put it out of my mind so I don't get too excited. I have got 1,100 different versions of the talk. Um, I'm not sure which one's going to come out and I'm not doing any um, visuals to go because I will go off piste, you can guarantee. So uh, we shall see on the day what happens. What's your, what's your talk called? Um, the Finding the Power of You and Your Unique Magnificence. Wow, unique, <laughs> magnificent, magnificence, Magi- that's Magnificence, cool. yes, one of those. Yes. Oh, very, very cool. Awesome. Well, that'll be, that'll be lots of fun. Okay, so. How do people find out more about you, Kathy? Um, I have a website, www.kathyprice, K-A-T-H-Y-P-R-I-C-E.co.uk. I'm on Facebook, The Point of Balance, which is the name of my work. I'm also on Facebook, Kathy Price. I'm also on Instagram. Oh, God knows what that is. Point of Balance, Kathy Price, Kathy Price, Point of Balance. Who knows? Who knows? But, um, yeah, if you just go to any of those, you can get in touch with me. And um, I just want to say thank you to all the people who did get in touch with me since the last um, podcast and who listened to the podcast. And I've just blown my socks off completely, and I'm so grateful to you, Warwick, for putting me there and to everybody that responded because, ah, you know, my life's purpose, I'm living it. And how good is that? That's awesome. That's all you can ask for, isn't it? Totally. Well, it's been great chatting with you again. Thanks so much for joining me. Well, thank you so much for having me. And we have covered a few subjects there. (laughs) We have, we have. And I will see you in um, Antonio in November. Wonderful. I look forward to it. You take care. You too. So uh, all you guys at home, thanks 
again for listening and we'll catch you on the next episode of the journey on podcast thanks for being a part of the journey on podcast with warwick schiller warwick has over 850 full-length training videos on his online video library at videos.warwickschiller.com be sure to follow warwick on youtube facebook and instagram to see his latest training advice and insights